Wildfires are unplanned and uncontrollable fires that can put life and property at risk. These fires can be caused by lightning or human ignitions, either accidental or arson related. Prescribed fires or controlled burns are planned and intentionally ignited to meet certain land management objectives. Uses for prescribed burns often include invasive plant control, regeneration of native tree seedlings, enhancing wildlife habitat, and reducing the threat of hazardous wildfires. Fire can rejuvenate a natural landscape and improve native habitat. Many species in the southeast depend on fire for survival, such as the chestnut oak, red cockaded woodpecker, and pine snakes, to name a few. Fires break down organic material much faster than decomposition, thus renewing soil nutrients more quickly. This triggers a rebirth of forests, helping to maintain native plant species. It provides more fertile soil and opens up the forest canopy, promoting vitality and the luscious growth of grasses and forbs. Fire exposes seeds and attracts insects, providing many important animal species food to forage. Fires can also reduce fuel buildup, such as dead vegetation and wood mass, lowering the risk of catastrophic wildfires. My name is Dakota Wagner, and I am the Southeast Region Coordinator with the Forest Stewards Guild. But there are several reasons why you might want to do a prescribed burn in your woods. Uh, one of them is fuel reduction, just to make sure that all the brown and dead and woody debris is reduced, just in case a wildfire actually does come through, it will be less intense. Um, you could also promote native habitat for wildlife species as well as tree species that do very well with fire such as oak and shortleaf pine. My name is Wesley Skeeto. I work with the North Carolina Forest Service. I'm a mitigation forester for the western half of the state. Controlled burns or also called prescribed burns, uh, that's a, a key element is right there in that name. A prescription. In North Carolina, to be covered under the Prescribed Burn Act, you have to have a prescription, uh, a burn plan, to cover your prescribed burn activities, your control burn. Getting with your local county ranger is a good way, a uh, good resource for you to get this prescription done. Uh, some reasons for this are smoke management uh, all around you and all around your burn unit uh, that you're, you're going to have is you know smoke sensitive areas you have hospitals you have schools you have chicken houses so you really want to make sure that your smoke doesn't negatively impact these smoke sensitive areas when you're doing your prescribed burn a good way to do this is to have a prescription to know what days what wind directions you can burn on you also have objectives that are written into this prescription and those objectives uh, a lot of times wind, speed, in, it, in addition to direction, uh, is, a, is a big part of that. Uh, your availability of your fuel. How dry of a day do you want to burn on? How windy of a day do you want to burn on? What fuels do you want to be available? What intensity do you want your fire to, to be? These are key components of what goes into a prescription for a prescribed fire. So as you're going around preparing for your prescribed burn, you've got your control lines established. A lot of time you have prep work involved. And prep work involves keeping the fire where you want it to be. Uh, and, and one of those hazards that you have to address sometimes is dead trees like the one behind me. You can come through with a chainsaw, you can, you can fell these, but a simpler option sometimes can be raking around them. And you see how we've done on the ground here, uh, raked all the fuel away from the snag, gave it a good wide berth. Uh, even though this one's got, uh, it's kind of punky, kind of doty, it's got some, some rot in there. That will oftentimes on a drier day, uh, our minimum RH only got down to about uh, 32 during the window for today's burn. So really, really not a big, big risk there. If you get RHs that are lower, fuels that are drier, uh, periods of drought, you will catch an ember in a tree like this 
and have to come back and, and oftentimes spend a lot of water or a lot of time with a chainsaw cutting it down anyway. But on a day like today, raking was appropriate for this tree and uh, you, can, you can see how, uh, how the fire was kept away and uh, the tree was not ignited. This is the available fuel that you have to consider in your fuel loading sometimes. And in this case, we really wanted to, because it was on the edge of the burn unit, keep this tree from catching a flame. So a lot of times after the burn is over, you'll begin your mop up phase. And that's when we come around and fuels like this one here that's carrying a flame uh, and sitting there can continue to smoke. Uh, a lot of times stumps will continue to burn for days after the burn. So we really can't have the, the, the ignition potential around the edges. Uh, we'll come around and, and Bob just pulled up. He's going to spray some water on these and uh, get, them, get them cleaned up where we can leave the burn and feel good about that it's not going to escape across the control lines. got the CPP, CWPP through the U.S. Forest Service. There's also through the NRCS. Uh, you've got the EQIP program uh, is another program that's available to, to the landowners to help them burn on their land. Uh, you just contact your local county ranger. Uh, if you don't already have contact with that person, you can seek them out on our website, www.NorthCarolinaForestService.gov, G-O-V, N-C, Forest Service GOV. Um, that'll put you in contact with your local county ranger who can work you through uh, the different eligibilities for these programs. The wildlife we have here in the southern Appalachians is very diverse and uh, they require a lot of diverse habitats to meet their needs for uh, reproduction and, and foraging and all sorts of other reasons. And um, Due to land use change throughout history, uh, habitat is, is very altered. There's a lot of tools in the toolbox for active habitat management, and prescribed burning is one of those. And prescribed burning is very uh, efficient in terms of cost and time, and so it's a, a good idea to entertain the possibility of prescribed burning uh, for habitat management. A lot of that comes back to our habitat here. You know, we're, we're a lot different than out west where they burn during the summer and, and have snows during the winter. Our fuels are different, and by fuels I just mean the vegetation on the ground, the, the leaves and branches, and really we have to wait until fall till the leaves fall off the ground. That, that opens up the canopy and provides that leaf litter, those, those dead fine fuels that we can burn. And we're really limited by that here in, in the Southern Apps. So we're burning during what we call the dormant season when everything is dead and, and we have all that fuel. So from maybe late fall all the way up through, usually by the end of April, we're kind of wrapping it up, just, just logistically speaking. Yep. Uh, and we may, we may vary timing or size of burns because of nesting and that kind of thing. But, but mostly it really just comes back to when we can burn. It is true that the prescribed burn can displace animals uh, temporarily. Uh, generally speaking, most of your bigger animals are going to just run out of the way. Um, when we show up with trucks and doors slamming and the water pump filling up the pumper truck and all that, you know, that's a lot of disturbance that they're not used to hearing. So a lot of the larger animals will go ahead and just leave the area before we even light a match. Um, and then a lot of the smaller animals, birds and bats, they're capable of flying away um, pretty quickly as well. A lot of your smaller animals, uh, rodents and snakes and salamanders, stuff like that, they can seek shelter underground in a burrow or they can get under a fallen log or in a rock outcropping, something like that to take shelter. Um, I will note that you know sometimes there is a mortality or an injury to wildlife and, and it is rare, but it does happen from time to time. Um, but consider that when we're talking about doing this habitat management with prescribed fire, we're really managing for the population 
up to animal and, or groups of animals and not really managing for the individual animals. The specific objectives on this burn unit were reducing mountain laurel and rhododendron thickets. Uh, we have some places through fire exclusion, uh, they, they gain such a, a foothold that they shade out any other potential regen. Uh, we've got hardwood regeneration, uh, you know, browse for wildlife. Anytime you get such uh, thickets, you, you've got uh, really a limited opportunity for anything to be growing underneath for those wildlife to eat. So after your burn, uh, we are now across Staten Road at DuPont Recreational State Forest and we're looking at our post burn effects on the sheep mountain burn that was done about three weeks ago. Uh, if you look behind me, this is one of your metrics that you want to look for. When you're writing your burn plan, you have an allowable scorch, which conveys your intensity of your burn. Depending on your objectives, you may want a higher or lower intensity. Over here, we were going after white pine regeneration. Um, similar to what we did across the street at the demonstration burn. Uh, this was a little bit bigger unit, it was a little bit drier day. Uh, so we'll see here in a second some of the, the white pine regeneration effects that we achieved. But the allowable scorch we had on this burn plan was six to eight feet. As you can see behind me, mature white pine. We've got about, uh, about a four or five foot scorch mark. So that's, that's kind of what you were going for, that you see that line up that that's your, your allowable scorch, and that's what you come and see. Now you're, you're gonna have a tree every now and again that has greater than that. Um, sometimes you have a jackpot of fuels. If you get a top fall out of a tree, you may have a pretty good scorch on a tree, but it's not representative of the whole unit. You wanna take an average as you're walking through. So we've talked about scorch on the trunk of the tree and how that's attributed to the desired intensity of the fire going, going around doing your post burn evaluations. If you look across the hillside behind me, you also have needle scorch, which is where the brown needles show up on the white pine regeneration that you have on the hillside behind me. One of the objectives of this burn was to reduce white pine uh, component within the forest structure. And as you can see, with this amount of needle scorch, uh, some of the four foot and below are completely without needles. And then as you transition up near the top, uh, some of those taller ones get up around seven feet or so. They've got a little bit of green clinging on at the top. Um, those trees are probably going to, uh, to be successful in getting mortality on those with that amount of needle scorch. As a private landowner in North Carolina, you can burn on your own land uh, without any kind of certification. There, there are classes available to you. Uh, several times a year, the North Carolina Forest Service will put on a certified burner program where you can learn all the things that go into uh, writing a prescribed burn plan. You'll be under the tutelage of, of people from the North Carolina Forest Service regarding fuels, weather parameters, resources required, uh, all the things that go into a burn plan. And that is not a requirement, but it is highly recommended. So my name is Justin Query. I'm the Assistant Regional Forester for the Mountain Region of the North Carolina Forest Service. Uh, I want to talk to you today about uh, prescribed burn associations or also known as PBAs. Uh, throughout North Carolina we've had these around for several years now. However, they've been predominantly in the eastern part of the state. There is a push uh, here the past few years to get a prescribed burn association for the western part of North Carolina also. Uh, PBAs are a great resource for private landowners. Uh, they offer you know, a lot of educational opportunities for them. Uh, it connects them with other landowners trying to do prescribed burns on their own properties. And then it'll also connect them with uh, other uh, agencies such as the North Carolina Forest Service or um, the Nature Conservancy, uh, a host of other uh, resources out there to help them in getting their prescribed burns done. But, you know, we don't really recommend uh, 
most landowners to go out and try to do prescribed burns on their own property without the right uh, training and certifications. PVAs will also help connect landowners uh, with the proper tools that will be needed. Uh, most private landowners do not have drip torches. Uh, they may not have fire rakes readily available to them. Uh, so this will, this will also provide the tools and resources needed to conduct these prescribed burns on their own property.